Let me say, give yourself a brief introduction. As I said, um, or Liz said, I'm Head of Distribution and Exhibition at the Film Council. Previously, as some kind of affidavit, I spent 20-odd years in the distribution and exhibition in the for-profit sector. And this talk is based upon the luxury I now seem to have to be able to think beyond the next film opening or the Monday holdover figures. And the result of that, this speech, are thoughts from that ability to have time to speculate and think around the biggest change to the film business since the advent of television. Now, the focus of this particular talk is around audiences and the digital revolution that is about, or already is, hitting film. The problem the film industry is facing, or the opportunity, is simple. For 100 years, the industry has constructed revenue models that were created in a world when it was actually difficult for consumers to see films. Or more specifically, often very difficult to see a particular film that they wanted to see. And it's worth having a look at what I mean by this as it helps to contextualise some of the current and future stresses, strains and opportunities that we're facing. Film. The very first ability for a moving image to be duplicated and then sent out to be seen by millions. It may seem simple now in our digital age where copying is often a click and sending another click, but the ability to copy moving data to be seen by others via the new technology of film is a huge first. And not surprisingly, people loved it and as a consequence, buildings are built to show these copies in. And by the way, the technology of copying and moving these around is the same today as it was 100 years ago, 35 millimeter and a petrol engine. Cinemas, however, are expensive to build, have a fixed cost overhead, and exist only in a catchment area of physical space. So the gatekeepers to the cinema, the programmers, are forced by the retailing laws of physical space to play the film that is most likely to appeal to the most people within their particular catchment area. And usually, that means one film per screen for the week. A highly selective and disempowering process for the consumer, but then there was no choice. Now, TV arrives, and TV is basically exactly like the cinema business. It's expensive to run, it has fixed cost overhead, and exists in an area of physical space, usually the country. It too had to commission and play the programs that was most likely to appeal to the most people within the particular catchment area or country. The two mediums suit each other, and film began to be watched on television after the two cinema release, usually, and not unexpectedly, given the above, the blockbuster films of the day, as demonstrated by their cinema success. In other words, they would have the most chance of getting the most people watching on television at the right time and day for the television station. Video, and DVD, arrives in the early 80s, and a different shop appears on the high street and a video player at home. Choice is increased hugely, but is still restricted by the same retailing laws of the cinema, and namely fixed overheads and catchment area. Buyers for the stores stick to mainstream product. Now that fills the shelves. Issues such as copy depth become important in the industry, and distributors compete viciously to convince the retailer that their particular film will rent a lot, and therefore they should buy a lot of copies in depth, or copy depth. And indeed, the same thing applied when sell-through took off a short time later, and the DVD appeared. Now, you probably spotted a theme here. The history of our business has been based upon basic retailing laws. It's meant a series of gatekeepers and delivery mechanisms that by necessity, in turn, means restricted choice, supply, and access. And so, in turn, the film business has built upon that paradigm and created value chains that are now dependent upon restricting choice, supply, and access. It's arguable that from the consumer perspective that the film industry's main distribution role is to prevent people seeing a film. The questions consumers ask themselves about a film is, where's it on? Is it out on DVD yet? Is it on TV tonight? They have to find it and hope that by some weird magic of time and space that it might, just might, be available. And this is, of course, what we also call in the industry as windows, a way of maximising profits by restricting supply. Four months from theatrical to DVD, two months to pay-per-view, four months to pay, six months to television, or whatever it is in each country in the world, because it does differ, and not because of different consumer desires, but purely due to the relative strengths and demand of each player in the supply chain and their attempts to either protect their exclusivity and or to encroach on someone else in the supply chain. So to back this up, we've created laws to fine people and even lock them up if they attempt to watch something when they want to rather than when it suits us. 
And of course, more recently, we also try and lock up content with DRM to make it difficult to copy a DVD or copy a film to the hard drive, etc., etc. But now we have the digital revolution. And in that revolution, the physical laws of space in the shape of a TV channel, a cinema screen, a high street store are almost non-existent. Now consumers can have enormous choice of, say, books online via Amazon, 2 million books online as opposed to the largest uh, retailer, which is 130,000 books. And there is some or a lot of evidence in the book and record industry that given a large choice, consumers migrate and discover and enjoy books that they would not normally ever encounter. Assisted, as well, if you like, by the try that marketing and personalised encouragements that these sites have and are developing. Netflix in the USA and Love Film in the UK are the leaders in the film world in this so-called long-tail revolution of consumer behaviour via unlimited choice. The biggest renter recently in Love Film, for example, was Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind. Now, what I've just basically gone through there is what's called the long-tail phenomenon. Um, I'm not going to go into it any further, but for those who don't know about it, and it's one of the most radical pieces of thinking that's been going on in the last four or five years in, in um, film and music uh, distribution and retailing, Look it up on Wikipedia, and I urge you to do that. So the first part of this talk has attempted to point out the restrictive paradigms that exist from the consumer's perspective. Consumers would like film when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it. And the industry is just not used to that. And that is the opportunity. By being consumer-focused and being entrepreneurial, the rule book can be thrown away and a new one created that has only one rule. Give the consumer exactly what they want, when they want it, where they want it, and how they want it. And don't deviate from that. The reason to throw it away is that for the majority of films, the old system does not work. Distribution systems squeeze out so-called minority taste films. And I'll just give you an example on this for one particular moment, in, in a classic one that most people have in independent film, is the way that independent film is currently financed and then distributed. It's distributed by sales agents who go out around the world and find an orthodox distributor territory by territory to buy the film. In large swathes of the world, most independent films are never sold. It's probably, in the, or you get an advance of $2,000 for a billion people in India or $5,000 for the Latin America, if you're lucky. But in most cases, these films aren't even sold, and in the old world, that's the end of it. Your film has no chance of getting access or seen or being put out there at all. That's just an example of what the old system does. Now, throwing a rule book away in practice can get extremely scary, and in certain cases, apparently impossible. But let's scare ourselves a second and have a little think about it. And this next section is on the consumer and the opportunities. Now, it's sadly short on knowledge. Basically, there are so few examples at the moment that are attempting to harness all the new opportunities of digital. Some of the best examples are in this room, and you're going to hear about them later, and I've drawn some thoughts from these in some uh, examples to follow. Issues or decisions facing the consumer are, I believe, quality of image, cost, and ease of viewing. And the primary issues facing the film owner are access and awareness. And I'll concentrate on the consumer. As I said, other speakers will talk about strategies for the access awareness conundrum. Now, and quality of image. For the consumer, that will vary wildly from one time point to another. At some point, I will want to see it on the big screen. And at another point, I will want to watch it on a mobile phone. Both are valid, and both are possible ones, even for the same film, for the same consumer. And the tough call for the rights holder or the filmmaker, is how far to respond to that desire. Do I really want my film being watched on a mobile phone? For me, the answer back would be, do I want my film watched? At the end of the day, if no one watches your film, there is absolutely no value in that film. Cost. This is extremely difficult. The issues here are that for some internet delivery methods, such as VOD and file sharing, people have got used to free. But let's take another rule that's for certain if no one sees the film, it has, again, no value. There are four possible ways that someone can get value out of a movie. The first one is subscription, which is the kind of love film model. The second one is transactional, VOD, where you just download it for a certain cost. The third one, which is an interesting one, is free with advertising. And I'll give you a kind of benchmark here, a couple of issues on this, which is roughly cinema advertising is around 70, cinema advertising translates to, in the UK, around 70p per admission. I don't know if that helps in any of the kind of VOD, kind of, you know, free VODs, what kind of benchmark in terms of what value that might be to an advertiser. But as we're in a new world here, it hasn't been really tested. 
Um, a couple of other issues in terms of that as well, in terms of advertising, and I'll talk about DRM a bit more in a minute, is that in terms of advertising stuff, where DRM might actually work here is on counting, actually tracking and counting. And I, again, this is an area I think that is really important to look at, is to how many people are watching this thing to realize some value back. How they watch it, where they watch it, maybe another issue. The fourth one is an interesting one that I only thought out or came to me about four months ago when I was teaching in Spain on this. And that's actually analog value. And this mirrors what I was briefly talking about about the music industry. I initially, it doesn't look particularly obvious that there's any analog value from film as opposed to the obvious things of live events in music. But if you are a filmmaker or involved in film production, there begins to be things that you can't really experience in the digital world and are actually quite safer. Safe, uh, so, uh, uh, safer in terms of like um, uh, sort of piracy issues, if you if you bothered about those, uh, set visits, uh, Q and A's, uh, live performances when people turn up, um, these are all things that people will pay for. Even t-shirts, um, t-shirts, email addresses, these are of, of value to the community, to the filmmaker, and so on. There's a number of different things that actually might add up to explore about in the sort of non-digital or analog way that may, if one follows the music industry, become more important and that it might be interesting for you to think about how you can actually begin to, to realize some value back on that. The third point was ease of viewing. And here, the interesting one here for me is around the issue of DRM. Now, I, this is not my quote, this is a quote from someone else, but uh, it, it, and it was, he was referring this more to the music industry, but uh, nobody ever gets up in the morning and says, I wonder which CD I'll buy, I must get the one that's got more DRM on it. And I think that's a really important point, because somewhere along the way here is that DRM is often being seen at the moment as a way of preventing things or extracting more value out of, out of a particular thing, because I might be able to do that. For example, um, it is perfectly technically possible using DRM that if you have two DVD players in your home, you can only watch it in one, you've got to pay extra if you want to watch it in the other. For example, okay, to trying to extract more value out of that. Essentially, allow, apart from the tracking things, from the consumer's perspective, DRM is a major problem. It's a major issue for them. How can I watch it? Where am I allowed to watch it? Can I plug it into my... You know, my, my DVD player that's a portable player as well as watching it on my computer, for example. So the issues around the attitudes towards the kind of like control and command systems and, it, and, and versus what the consumers want is an extremely important area to think about and discuss um, and consider in any strategy of getting your film out there. The second thing, and it's kind of linked really, is how do I encourage people, help people to actually see this stuff um, easily? For example, at the moment, there's quite a, seems to be quite a gap between the kind of PC streaming um, or the PC downloading, even if you're allowed to download um, onto a DVD and write it to a DVD using DRM, as to how you get it to see on the best place you've usually got in your home, which is a television. Um, now, actually, you can put it on a laptop and plug it in on the in the back of the TV, but very few people know that. Very few people know that. Or you have to buy a special box that allows for Sky or... BT Vision or whatever it is to actually try to give that gap between the internet and, um, and the television. These are the kind of more issues as well. Or you can just download your, uh, uh, write it to your DVD and plug it into your DVD player. But for some reason, the industry seems extremely scared about that at the moment. For me, for the consumer's perspective, this seems to make sense. Speed of downloading. Now, at the moment, we're still slow. The only country in the world that I'm aware of is Korea. I went to Korea recently, and it's a bit frightening. Um, the reason why it's scary is that two things have happened. One is that the DVD market has collapsed, and unusually, having got, the, got, the, got this information from the head of Sony there, they do not blame it on piracy. They blame it upon other internet use in the home. They have massively fat pipes, and 75% of them are actually, of, the, of Korean homes are, um, are linked up. What they're doing is they're playing with vast online communities, uh, gaming in certain instances, or just chatting or transferring files to each other extremely easily. This is a, this is a country that um, a is moving away from traditional film watching because fast pipes are allowing it to happen. So somewhere along the way that fast pipes are both an asset and uh, a, a, a could be an overall threat to the business, but it will continue to be a threat to the business unless you have a complete strategy that says, OK, I understand now that people can download a film in, say, five minutes, Right? How am I going to let them see it easily enough with this, these, the, the fast downloading? And the fourth point on this, and I'm go, going to go back into the kind of theatrical world for a second, and that's how cinema visits, because 
Yeah, I mean, disregarding the fact that I, you know, that basically the cinema world is highly restrictive and will continue to be restrictive, it is restrictive in the sense that um, that it is entirely based around the, the world of gatekeepers. Um, and the gatekeeper model is something that the consumer is continually and has been already, already facing for the last 100 years. And a classic example of gatekeeper goes like this. I make a movie. I want to get it in a festival. I have a gatekeeper in a festival. Festival director, whatever it is, thank God, says, you can play my uh, film in my festival. Right, got through one gatekeeper. Next one is I need a distributor. So distributors turn up, and my God, they like my film. I've got through another gatekeeper. I've got a film being sold in that territory. Distributor goes to the cinemas. Cinemas say, hmm, yeah, I'll play that film. The gatekeeper there, the programmer says, I'll play that film. And now it's finally in the cinema. When it goes into the cinema, only then and only then does any value get realized. It's only at that point do people actually know whether people want to see that film. The rest of it is a process of gatekeeper, educated guesswork. And that system is so successful that 75% of all cinema seats are unsold. <laughs> now, for me, there's a way around. Where the internet is particularly good and particularly scary for me and a lot of people probably in this room is that it transfers the power away from the gatekeeper and towards the consumer. And you can see that in many, many other businesses where the command and control structures of, say, linear broadcasting are being attacked by, I want to see TV when I want to watch it and the juiced and so on. This is scary stuff for people who are used to having a control channel that they can basically dictate to what people will watch when they want to watch it. Cinema is no exception. But given the rise of uh, social networking and given the rise in the last four or five years of the ease of people to join into virtual communities extremely quickly, witness that I love David Cameron kind of groups, etc. on Facebook or whatever it is. These are people that over a single issue or an interest can very, very fast get together. I see no reason at all why those people can't actually get together around a particular film and why they can't therefore turn up to the cinema and watch the film that they have already pre-arranged and pre-decided that this is the film that they actually want to see. Now, that's just an indication or another idea, in a sense, of how some of the unfolding possibilities of utilizing all aspects of digital and internet can actually transform, transform a way that a business is run, hopefully for the better, so you perhaps get a 50% occupancy rate in cinemas. Now, all of this is highly theoretical and experimental. And yet, I'm driven by the excitement and possibilities that this revolution offers, especially independent film. So to conclude, I thought I'd give a brief pricey of where the Film Council is at the moment. There is a need for the UK film industry to prepare itself for current and future digital media opportunities. And it's not clear at present how the industry, especially the independent sector, is planning to meet these opportunities. Deals are being made with such platform operators as Love Film for downloads, and some producers are beginning to look at a different way of selling their films worldwide. A new entrants such as BT are keen for content, and Arts Alliance Digital Media is pushing ahead on the deals required to digitize cinemas. However, these seem scattered, and the impression is that the industry is unclear how to respond strategically and in practice. Now, our vision is that all global consumers will have access to all British films on any platform, and the UK consumer on any platform will have access to a wide range of films from around the world. If that is the vision, how will this actually be achieved? And we will be working back from this vision to examine what are the issues that might exist to achieve that goal. So we're setting up to a group that will track digital initiatives across the UK Film Council and ensure that all market intelligence and knowledge are collected and shared across the different internal groups of the Film Council and empower the UK film industry to prepare for current and future commercial, consumer, technical opportunities and challenges. So we're currently meeting distributors and sales agents from my new colleague Sandra Brown, who's in the room at the moment, to discuss their views on what support they need in digital distribution and audience development, identifying what digital projects are already underway, and drawing up a potential list of digital initiatives, in, uh, and so on. In all cases, communication of finding and results of activities is paramount. A coherent communication strategy would be put into place that demonstrates to you, the wider industry, and stakeholders what are our results and findings are, and thereby, hopefully, helping the UK film industry seize the opportunities that digital offers and, in turn, realising the overall goals of the Film Council. In other words, we'll be working with you to make sure we all grab this amazing chance we've been given by the weird and very disruptive technology of digital. Thank you. There's one over there, sorry.
Hi. Um, I just want to ask how um, what you sp were speaking about um, connects with what Ira Deutschman was talking about in terms of the technology that's going to go into cinemas and the digital standards. And are we going to end up in a sort of NTSC PAL sort of situation where actually digital exists, but you can show it here, but you can't show it there, depending on what you're doing? Uh, I beg to bit differ with Ira. He knows I differ with him. I agree with you that's a risk, and I don't think that's a help for filmmakers, and I don't think it's a help for independent distribution. I think it could be a nightmare. Sorry, there's the next one. Yep. Down in front here. Down in front here, whoever's got the mic. <laughs> Stick your hand up, mate. Okay, um, first of all, fantastic, thank you. Um, big problem when talking to financiers, I've got a team of financiers who want to finance mm. my movie. I've got no idea how much my budget should be because if I'm going to do it this way, I've got no idea whatsoever how my returns are going to be mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. I can cast my film mm -hmm. and what kind of budgets. So it just seems like I'm in this whole area mm -hmm. of like, do I go theatrical when I can actually show them some kind of model mm -hmm. and they can actually know that these are finance people, whereas this way they just laugh at me. Correct. That's an extremely good question. Do you all hear that? Yeah. I mean, this, this, I mean, you can't get much more important than trying to figure out value. Um, you know, trying to, how do I get value back? Um, the first point about this is, is that, that you know, the, the old-fashioned form of independent filmmaking, which is you get sales estimates from the sales agents to take it to a bank and hope you get a bit of public money and all that kind of stuff, etc., is entirely based, of course, on the sales figures and whether you actually realise those. And as I've already said, most of them actually don't like, realise or you're heavily dependent on one or two territories to be sold. Um, the, if you're going to grasp the opportunities of, 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 uh, distribu of, of alternative forms of distribution, there is very little information around at the moment that can actually help a financier to, or a financial make sense to a bank, for example, to, to, to try and figure out what a business plan it might look like for distribution. Um, having said that, that um, I do think, and that's the end of my speech, I do think that it's our role as the Film Council to try and like, big, begin to tease those issues out. And I know that there's a working group that's already done one particular model, which is on the website, but I think it needs, is going to move on to get some better and deeper understanding in terms of, like, you know, um, for example, what's the total broadband take-up in the world going to be in the next five years? And, you know, how, what kind of take-up are those people doing when they're watching movies? What, how much might you, your delivery costs if you went on to worldwide online distribution or, you know, for VOD? Or how, many, how many units might you be reasonably expected to get and what's the cost of delivering that? So, you know, but at the moment, I would agree with you that the, 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 the independent sector, which is based upon a model which is based on territory by territory selling, is stuck at the moment. And the financing models are probably preventing some true experimentation because, precisely because of lack of knowledge to give to the financiers. So, you know, I'll, I'll take your point. Um, gentlemen there? Okay, um, since the Internet is by its nature international, yeah. Are we assuming when we're talking about audience development that, let's say for example, films or American independent films, that the way of marketing to an audience, let's say a home-based audience, is the same as to an international audience? I don't know if that's completely true. I think that, for example, um, one can market UK films here um, in a certain kind of way that, that reaches to, uh, the interest of an audience and that in other parts of the world it maybe represents a... I don't know, a kind of a different model, a different approach, an exotica perhaps, or something along those lines. In other words, is it one size fits all marketing models that will work, or will one really be able to actually employ different kinds of marketing strategies based on cultural differences? Uh, I, I mean, I think that'll be answered much better a bit later on in the, in the day, but I mean, I think the first point is I think there's a difference between marketing and positioning and marketing and distribution. Uh, I'm probably more emphasizing on the distribution aspects of this. I think probably you know, each, each country or different countries will have different way, a different uh, broadband penetration or, an, or, in fact, different DVD online distribution and so on. Uh, that will make a difference in terms of what your deals are in those particular countries. Uh, your positioning of the film probably will alter as well from country to country, your positioning of that film. One, one country's mainstream is another country's art house. Uh, I'm more concentrating on the whole issue of, uh, of, of access and value, you know, like, uh, you know how, that, how, you, how you kind of like get the nuts and bolts in place. Because without that, it doesn't matter what your positioning is, no one, get, no one knows or get access to your movie. One more. One more. Um, there's a gentleman there.
Yeah, our company is Breakthrough Distribution. We've been supporting the independent film community for two years uh, in self-distributing their film. We, bes we help provide the engine to help them do that. And we've found that most of the DVDs sit on the shelves. We do, you know, we've done over 80 films, and uh, including Four-Eyed Monsters. And wouldn't you say, well, what we're finding is that without proper viral marketing and guerrilla marketing, mm -hmm. Um, every film, all, none of these films will have any value unless the independent film community learns how to reach their core audience. Correct. Correct. <laughs> you know, I, I'd said that the two issues in the filmmaker are access and awareness, and I'm not going to cover the awareness bit. You know, if people, don't, uh, if people aren't aware about your film, that even if there's access, they're not going to get it. So the kind of strategies are going to be talked about later, in, in especially in the viral or community-based kind of stuff, which is you know, cheaper ways of accessing an audience and buying a lot of ads or TV space is perfectly suited and, and for the first time again I mean the two revolutions that are going on is it's hand in hand in the last like five years is you know faster access through broadband and, and, and internet take up generally and the second one of course is social networking sites you know which didn't exist for you five years ago and that that kind of that, that's not a magic bullet but it does give you a huge opportunity to to communicate to a community or for interested in you as opposed to sticking up just a website and hoping they come to you. So there are, there are changes, again, in the ways that filmmakers can communicate to, to audiences that, I, that, that can only be of an advantage to get around some of the issues you're pointing out. Okay, I think that's my last one. Okay, okay thanks very much.